Um, let's get this thing started. So, hello everyone, hi again. Uh, for some of you I'm meeting for the second time, maybe even a few of you for the first time. Hello, hope you're all fine and doing well, all considered. Uh, 2020 has been crazy so far. Um, do I want to do that or? Yeah, maybe I'll do that. So if you were missing and you, you didn't catch the first lecture, uh, I just posted a link to a questionnaire that I wanted everyone to do. I'm also going to cross check that with some other with the zoom registrations um, to check for attendance. So that's very important just to give me a demographics on the class. If you already filled it out, you don't have to do it again. But anyone who's new and didn't get a chance to actually fill that out, uh, go ahead and click the link in the chat and fill that out. Uh, that being said, we are going to move on. We have There's someone waiting here. Let's let them in. Okay. Um, so yeah, last, uh, just a quick recap on what was covered last time. Of course, we just introduced the class, went over the syllabus with you guys and the intricacies of that. Um, for those of you who were missing, this is the class website. Um, there are a couple ways you can find that. Maybe I'll just uh, quickly run through and show you that again as well. Um, yeah, maybe I should do that. So as you can see now, and usually I turn off the video uh, when I'm uh, sharing my screen because it just, it reduces uh, any lag that is there. So uh, right now you can just listen to my voice. Um, but yeah, this is the website. This is my main website. You can find it easily by just Googling like CCNY math or something like that. Um, click on clicking on any one of these links uh, doesn't matter but as long as you get into the website uh, you are going to go to one of the main menu bars on the left that's people and then you can scroll all the way down and I'm almost at the end because my last name is Smith it's alphabetically arranged by last name so you can click on that and it will ultimately bring you to this page here once you're in this page you can actually click on the link to the class here And sometimes this takes a little while to load. Um, but yeah, there we go. Once you're in the class, you'll notice that uh, one of the first things linked to is the syllabus, which I went over in the first lecture. So if you click on that, you will see uh, an electronic copy of the syllabus with all these links here are actually clickable. This is actually a direct the link to the class website, the, the web page that we're currently on. Um, so once you can get there, you can find the website again. Um, this is my main website. Uh, that's our textbook and all that stuff we already introduced. This is the email that I want you to contact me by if you are my student. Everyone else uses my CCNY email. Um, so we went over that and all the links here are clickable. Uh, one other thing that you need to make sure that you have under control is the homework. So here's a link to the homework system that we're going to be using. It's free of charge for those of you who are new. Uh, log into that with your CCNY email credentials. If you have any troubles, e email me. I already had a few people emailing me and we're looking into um, getting their accounts set up. The first homework is due on the 7th, but that's just like an orientation kind of homework. It's nothing uh, particularly ha having to do with the class. Uh, maybe I can click on that. If you click on that, you log in with your CCNY email, you'll see a list of all the homeworks. Now, the first one is an orientation that's due on the 7th, but uh, all the homeworks that are regarding chapter two, uh, up to the first test, those are all due on uh, the 20th, June 20th. Then there's a second batch of homeworks that are all due on July 11th. So um, you cannot make up late homework, so make sure that you get all these homeworks done uh, by that date. Of course, I would recommend that the moment I cover something in class, you just do the homework for that section um, right away and just to, to keep on top of things. Um, so yeah, and as again, if you can't log in, 
uh, shoot me an email, let me know at javonteaches at gmail.com and we will uh, see what we can do to get you in. So that's the syllabus. Also, I post uh, the videos for these lectures uh, here. So if you click there, you will now notice that there is actually only one video in the playlist. Um, this was uh, yesterday's class. And if you were to click on that class, you'll notice that, I don't want to actually play it. You'll notice that here is a link to a PDF of the notes that I used for that class. So you can get to the notes and you can get to a video recording of what we did in the lectures and all that should be fine. Okay, so that was mostly for the new people. But yes, this our class webpage is very important. A lot of information that is going to be there and you should be checking this website uh, very frequently as the semester goes on. Uh, so that is just uh, getting everyone up to speed there. So we spoke about all that in the first lecture. So if you are missing for that class, uh, go back to that playlist, watch the first lecture. It's going to be very important. Uh, so we introduced the class, how it's going to be run, uh, the, the extra credit that I could give you on homework, all that good stuff, uh, how your grade is going to be calculated. Everything uh, was mentioned there. The only thing that's still a little bit up in the air is the platform that I'm going to use for quizzes and tests. But as I mentioned, I will inform you guys of that as soon as I find something viable and free. Uh, we also did a very basic introduction of this class and what it's about. I gave you a concrete example here. Uh, so this is uh, differential equations. So here we learn to solve differential equations, which are essentially just equations involving the derivatives of a function. And I spoke a little bit about what those are, why we should care about them, and one particular example about that arises naturally just by conducting some, a scientific experiment called Newton's cooling. Um, the prerequisites for this class, I believe, are Calc 3, even though technically you should be able to do this class if you went through Calc 2. It shouldn't be too much of a tr trouble. Um, however, I would highly recommend that you brush up on some basic linear algebra. You can do so by going to watching my lecture videos at this link, uh, starting from around lecture 16, um, or just brushing up from previous notes. Uh, so the basics of linear algebra are going to be very helpful for when I'm explaining certain concepts. So for the most part, this class is about teaching you methods for solving a variety of different differential equations. However, especially since all tests and quizzes are going to be online, and we know that our final is multiple choice, there is, uh, of course, it's going to be the case that a lot of the questions being asked on a multiple choice exam will be more conceptual, um, just so that to reduce cheating. So um, while the main goal here is for you to learn how to solve problems, how to do computations and all that good stuff, um, you will need to know about the concepts as well because you will be tested on them and they are kind of important. They do kind of uh, help you uh, figure out what kind of calculations that you would want to do. Okay, all right, so that was just a very quick recap of what we did last time. So, so far we didn't really get into anything uh, into the syllabus uh, specifically. We just introduced the class and introduced overall the main goal of this class and the, what we introduced the kinds of equations that we're going to be interested in studying here. So um, now you should be up to speed on just a summary. But of course, again, if you were missing in the first lecture, go back, watch that lecture video, give out a lot of important information there. Whew. Okay. Um, before we get started and we jump into actually uh, doing, uh, going through the syllabus, are there any questions uh, before we get started? Um, you can uh, turn on your audio or type in the chat if you have a questions. I'm monitoring both. And of course, at any given time while I'm teaching, if you have to chime in, if you have a question or you misunderstand something, uh, you can of course let me know. Uh, from time to time, I will be asking for your input, but if I'm just going on explaining something, you can uh, stop me if you uh, misunderstand something. So. I suppose there are no more questions before we begin. Okay. Also going to do a sound and internet check from time to time because, you know, sometimes uh, this thing gets a little bit glitchy 
so just give me a verification that everyone can actually hear me. I just, okay, awesome. Okay, good, thank you. All right, so let's actually jump into this. Let's uh, get down to the nitty gritty. Okay, uh, so what we are going to cover today are, we're gonna talk about classifications of ordinary differential equations. We're also gonna talk about separation of variables and population models. And if time permits, we'll also start talking about first order linear differential equations. So let's just jump right in. Uh, since we're all here, we're all ready to go uh, moving on. So some of these are definitions that we saw before, but I repeated them here. So just recall, uh, an equation that involves a function and its derivatives, we call this a differential equation. That's what these guys are. Sometimes I'll shorten that DE. Um, if a differential equation only involves a single variable function and its ordinary derivatives, the kind of uh, derivatives that you would study in Calculus 1 for single variable functions, uh, we call such an equation an ordinary differential equation. If you're studying a multivariable function where there are several independent variables, then such a differential equation is called a partial differential equation, or PDE. Um, both of these guys, highly applicable, very important stuff um, when it comes to applying uh, math to science and engineering and finance. Differential equations is an indispensable um, uh, field of study. So these we actually introduced last time. Now we're going to start getting a little bit more specific. So now I also want to talk to you about the order of a differential equation. So when we say talk about the order of a differential equation, we can say something is a first order, or a second order, or a third order, or 10th order. We can talk about the order of a differential equation, and that is simply just the highest derivative that appears, right? So if you are looking at a differential equation and there's an nth order derivative that appears, um, we call that an nth order or differential equation. And for, the, for now, we're going to focus mostly on ordinary differential equations. We'll do a little bit about PDEs towards the end of the class, but the majority of the class, the vast majority, we'll be talking about ODEs. Um, so uh, there is a PDE class, but it's a whole other class. Uh, this class mostly focuses on ODEs. So with this here, big F of T, Y, Y prime, Y double prime, all the way up to Y to the nth derivative equals K. This is just the implicit form of a general differential equation it is a function of these variables. T is your independent variable here. Um, very commonly, we want to use time as our independent variable. So you'll often see T for the independent variable instead of X's, which you're used to. Um, but yes, the, we have our dependent variable or, or function here, which is Y. And then we have a bunch of derivatives going all the way up to the nth derivative. Now this is a function, which means you don't have to have all the derivatives visibly appearing, but you definitely need to have the highest derivative visibly appearing. And that will tell you what the order of the differential equation is. Um, K is just a constant. So this is like a function if we just move everything to one side, or it's possibly not a function. We'll talk about that a little bit, okay? So for example, this guy, uh, y double prime, this guy right here, uh, y double prime plus 5t y prime equals e to the t is a second order differential equation, right? I know it's a second order because I look at all the derivatives that appear. There's a second order derivative and there is a uh, first order derivative. The highest derivative is the second derivative. Therefore, this is a second order differential equation. y prime equals 4y is a first order differential equation. Y times Y triple prime minus four over T Y squared equals cosine of T is a third order differential equation because the highest derivative is the third derivative. Okay, so, so far are we clear on what order means? Just the highest derivative that appears. Well, I'll see if we're clear because I'll ask you some questions about that um, in, a, in, a, in a little bit. Now, this is also something we spoke about uh, yesterday to solve a differential equation. So remember, a differential equation is an equation that has a function and its derivatives involved in the equation. What does it mean to solve a differential equation? This is our main goal in the class, learning how to solve differential equations and looking at a few applications. Um, what it means is that we need to find a relationship in terms of the independent and dependent variables only. We do not want the derivatives in play anymore. 
So if we go from a situation where the derivatives are around to a situation where the derivatives are not around, and these two equations are true at the same time in all instances, this guy is called the solution to differential, the differential equation. And we looked at an example of that yesterday as well. Sometimes it, it is preferable if we have the uh, solution explicitly defined, meaning that you have the dependent variable by itself on one side and only the independent variable potentially on the other side. Um, but of course, if your x's and t's are mixed together and you have an implicit form of the solution, um, sometimes that's the best you can get away with. Uh, going back to yesterday's example, uh, when we found the solution, this here was an explicit form of the solution because t is big T is by itself on one side. However, if I was in a situation like uh, this situation here would be called an implicit solution, right? Without the E's, right? So this is where the big T is not solved for by itself on one side. It's kind of mixed up in some other functions, okay? So sometimes you can only get to a function, a, a solution to your differential equation in this form, but in general, we want to be able to isolate the dependent variable whenever possible, as long as it's not too much trouble. Okay, so that's what it means to solve a differential equation. Uh, figure out how to describe the relationship between the independent and dependent variables without the use of derivatives. Okay, um, so another thing, uh, linear. If your function that describes your differential equation is a linear function in the y's, and that's very important, it's linear in the y's, we call it a linear ODE. Okay. And we'll do some examples here. And we can classify ODEs based on their order and whether they're linear or not. And this is actually something that's very important because the order of the differential equation is going to tell you about what kind of methods you're allowed to employ and certain ideas, certain approaches that you might want to have. So knowing that you're looking at a first order linear ODE versus a first order nonlinear ODE, different strategies will work for one versus working with a third order linear ODE, right? There will be different strategies uh, for different classifications. So classification is going to be an important thing. So in that regard, I would like us to uh, classify these together. So I am both going to test whether you understand what the order of a differential equation is and whether you understand what um, what a linear versus a nonlinear differential equation is. Okay, so here is where you guys will have a chance to chime in. And let me start getting used to writing now. All right, so uh, tell me about example one, part A. We're gonna classify these. So you're gonna tell me about the order of the differential equation that's there. And then you are going to tell me about whether it's linear or not. So about part A, someone help me with part A. dy dx equals y. Okay, so this is a first order. Linear or nonlinear? Linear. So, right, so this is a first order linear. How do I know it's linear? Because if I bring everything to one side, y prime minus y equals zero, this means that my big F is equal to y prime minus y. And this is just a linear combination of y prime and y. This is a linear function. Of y's, right? Meaning I don't have the y's raised to any powers other than zero and one. Uh, they're not, I don't have y's multiplying each other. I don't have y's in so, inside of any nonlinear functions. So this is a first order linear. Uh, what about the second one? Part B. It's a second order. What is it? Uh, so we don't say second degree, we say second order. Uh, and it's linear. So this one is a second order linear. Uh, the third one. Yep. 
It is second order, nonlinear. So this is second order, nonlinear. Uh, why the y's are multiplying each other. Uh, D. Okay, so D is a first order nonlinear. The highest derivative to appear is the first derivative. However, it is squared. So this is a first order. non-linear and the y prime is squared what about e y prime plus sine of y equals four Ah, so we finally have some uh, discrepancies here. Some people think it's linear, some think it's not. It is first order, so everyone is right on that account because the highest derivative is, um, is the first derivative. It is, drum roll, nonlinear. How do you know it's nonlinear? Well, it's nonlinear because of the sine of y. It's not a linear function. Okay. All right, what about F? Uh, we also have some disagreements here. So I do have some people think it's nonlinear. Some people think it's linear. Okay, so everyone agrees that it's third order. So there we have agreement. That one's kind of obvious. You see the y triple prime in the first part. So yeah. Now, um, is it linear versus nonlinear? Drum roll. That was supposed to be a simple. It is linear. <laughs> yeah, leave me alone with my dad jokes. It is actually linear. Now, why is it linear? Now, I, I, I have an idea of why some people said it's not linear, because I made a, a whole big deal in the previous example about the sine function not being a linear function. However, notice in this example here, in example f, the sine function has x's inside of it, which means it is not linear in the x's, right? However, the y is outside of the sine function. And as far as you're concerned, if I think of all the functions of x's as constants, then this guy kind of looks like lines. It's just a constant times y, okay? So it's not sine of y, it's sine of x's. The functions of the independent variable can do whatever they want. When we refer to linear, we are referring to linear in the dependent variable. So that's why in this definition, I underlined linear in y, linear in the function y. Uh, as in linear in the dependent variable. Okay, so the the in the independent variable doesn't have to be linear. So here you can have an x cubed, you can have a sine of x. Uh, the x's can do whatever they want, right? But uh, the y's have to behave linear. So you can't have y's inside of a sine or a y inside of an exponential or a y multiplying some other y or a y raised to a power that's not zero or one. So linear refers to the dependent variable, okay? All right, so hopefully that clears up what the order of a differential equation is. Everyone has that under control, um, but linear versus nonlinear, uh, we, have, we had some disagreements there. Hopefully these are now laid to rest. Um, so that's what I mean by linear in the first one. Now, let's go back to the first example. dy dx equals y. Now, can anyone by eyeballing that maybe tell me what the answer is? 
In other words, I'm asking you to solve this differential equation. Tell me this, what is the solution to this guy? E to the X is a solution. Notice Y equals E to the X is a solution, right? This is a function such that its derivative is equal to the original function. Is there any other function? Can you think of any other possible solution to this differential equation? So this is a solution uh, because it makes the ODE true and it contains no derivatives. So if my y is e to the x, then for sure y prime would be equal to y because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Can anyone think of any other answers, any other possibilities? Any constant times e to the x would work. Y equals C e to the x is a, well, is a solution for every C, um, including uh, including notice that C equals zero to give Y equals zero. Okay, so notice that y equals zero is also a solution. The derivative of zero is zero. So y equals zero is also a function. Now it turns out the most important function here is this one. Notice that that function includes all these other solutions. So some typical uh, answers that students give are y equals zero is a solution, y equals e to the x, a lot of students see that. Um, now, you can also have any constant times e to the x this will work for by the constant factor rule that we learned from talk one. And so that, that y equals c e to the x has really, it's a family of solutions. So this is called a family of solutions here. And um, whenever you have a family of solutions, you can describe a whole set of solutions that solves a differential equation in such a way that every possible solution is included in that description. We call that family of solutions the general solution of the differential equation. I'll talk about that in a little bit later. And I'm going to just uh, spoiler break, give you a spoiler right now. For this differential equation, dy dx equals y, this is the general solution, right? This happens to be the general solution. I define that later on. This happens to be the general solution. I defined it later. Okay. Now, you might be worried about Hmm, I wonder, well, I know y equals e to the x is a solution, and I know any constant times e to the x is a solution, but maybe there's another solution out there. Maybe there's some solution that we don't know about. Maybe there is this weird, interesting function that we didn't learn about in Calc 1, that we didn't learn about in Calc 2 or Calc 3, and it's just like there's some really high-level math out there where somewhere out there in the universe, there is some other kind of solution that can solve this differential equation. How do I know that all solutions it can be found uh, and have this form? Well, I'm glad you asked, proverbial student. Um, it turns out there is a theorem that helps us to know this, and this is something that we're going to discuss later on. There is something that's called the existence and uniqueness theorem, which is basically going to tell us when a solution exists and how its form would look up to uniqueness uh, with a constant factor. Right, so that's going to be very important. So in fact, we do know, of course, I haven't justified this to you yet, but we do know for a fact that dy dx equals y 
all possible solutions that could ever exist will have the form of a constant times e to the x. There are no solutions out there that we have to look for or that we're missing. So yeah, this is actually everybody. Now that's not something that I've justified yet, but at some point I will justify that to you guys, at least in a hand-waving fashion. But yeah, so you can look at this, and again, this is what it means to solve a differential equation. Can you come up with a relationship between the dependent and independent variable such that if that relationship is true, then the differential equation itself is also going to be true. And that relationship does not have a derivative in it. So I can say that y equals e to the x is a solution to this differential equation. And how do we find that? Well, by inspection, which sometimes is uh, not allowed. Obviously, if I'm in a class and under normal circumstances, I'd want you to show your work how you figured something out. So I know you didn't just like copy from someone the answer. But by inspection is just a fancy math way of saying, well, I eyeballed it and saw the answer. And, um, but in general, we'd want a little bit more justification than that. Um, but yeah, that happens to be it. And so, yes, turns out y equals ce to the x. Um, very glad someone came up with that before I typed it. Uh, hopefully you didn't see that. Uh, where c is a constant contains all possible solutions of this ODE, right? And whenever we can express a solution to an ODE in this way, uh, where a family solution solves it, um, solves it in general, we say that the, we have found the general solution of the ODE. Now, however, sometimes there's a specific member of the family of functions that we want to know about, right? So for example, if the question was instead phrased this way, solve this differential equation, this system here, uh, where we have dy dx equals y and y of zero is equal to three. The solution to that would be what? What do you think is the solution to that? Right, three e to the x, right? Y equals three e to the x would be the solution to that differential equation. Notice here, that if I differentiate that guy, I get the original back. So here you would have, you have dy dx equals y. And at the same time, if you plug in y of zero, that is just three e to the zero, which is three. And so I have a function that not only satisfies the differential equation, it is a solution, but also, it passes through a specific point, okay? Now, this equation here that is sometimes paired with a differential equation, this is called an initial condition, right? And whenever we have a solution that satisfies a differential equation and at the same time satisfies an initial condition, we call that a particular solution. So there is a difference between a general solution, something like y equals c e to the x, this is just something that would solve it in general. It is a solution for every C. It's an infinite set of solutions here. However, sometimes you want a very specific guy. Out of all of these guys, I want the one guy that moves through this point. When my x is zero, the y coordinate should be three. And again, that is something that the existence and uniqueness theorem tells us about. The fact that out of an infinite number of solutions, there is going to be, under certain conditions, only one specific function that solves your differential equation and passes through any coordinate that you want to choose, okay? Now, in this particular case, um, we have that uh, y equals e three to, three e to the x is that solution. Uh, so now I want to talk about, well, how did we, and, and here I also already mentioned the initial conditions, which I already said, okay. now. How did we find the above solution? Well, this kind of goes into something that I'm going to talk about even later, uh, separation of variables. Um, but at this point, I just want to, to show you, uh, those of you who couldn't figure out that it's three e to the x, uh, how would we know that three e to the x is the particular guy that we wanted? Well, Why am I writing in green? Uh, we know that, uh, 
that uh, y equals c e to the x was the general solution. So all solutions are found in this form. This means if I set y of 0 equals 3, that would imply that my y is equal to 3 when I plug in 0 for x. That, of course, implies that 3 is equal to c. And that, of course, implies if I, if I plug into the plug into the general solution, that is going to give me y equals 3 e to the x. Now, of course, a lot of you eyeballed that and saw that right here. But if, you, if it wasn't something that you could see right away, this is how you would go about figuring it out. So first, you would need to find the general solution. Um, we would need to find this first. We would need to find the general solution first, if we didn't before. So you first need to find the general solution. And then after that, you can find the particular solution by actually plugging in the points, plugging in the initial condition, right? So this here is called the initial condition. So by plugging in the initial condition into our general solution, we can solve for our arbitrary constant C. And after doing that, I can plug it back into this form and then I can get the particular C that would create the particular function that will solve my differential equation and pass through the point that I want. This is called the particular solution. Okay. Now, hopefully that is clear. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, just ask me. Okay. Now, um, here, notice I asked you about uh, solving it by inspection. That's kind of just seeing the answer. Now, of course, that's not always going to be easy to do. Sometimes you have a function that looks very complicated. So now we're going to want to explore ways in which um, we can figure out what a solution is, even if we can't eyeball it and we can't see it. So separation of variables, this is something that I actually introduced last class, but I want to go over it again. Separation of variables is one method. It's one of the easiest methods, right? This is kind of like when you're learning about integration and you learned integration by substitution. It's one particular method of integration and it's, the easy, it's one of the easiest methods out there to, to get to work. In the same way, when it comes to solving uh, ODEs, separation of variables is one of the easiest methods to get to work. And it's just one of many methods to solve a differential equation. Um, but I can talk about it right now because it's one of the easiest ones to talk about. So how would you go about figuring out that e to the x, or specifically 3e e to the x, would be the solution to this differential equation? How would you do it by hand? How would, what computations would you do to actually figure that out? Um, and when we do that, we say we're solving it analytically, not by inspection. Right? How would you solve this analytically? You're given something like this, dy dx equals y and y of 0 equals 3. Well, here's how we would do it with separation of variables, right? So I have dy dx equals y. Now, separation of variables, as the name suggests, and I, I type this out in words as well. So if I'm talking very fast, you can go back and you can check the notes. Separation of variables, as the name suggests, means we literally separate the variables in the sense that we are going to separate the independent and the dependent variables. So I want all the y's on one side and all the x's on the other side, okay? Now, traditionally, or we normally put the dependent variable on the left side, even though strictly speaking, it's not necessary. Everyone kind of does it this way. Uh, so I can divide both sides by y, assuming y is not zero, and then multiply both sides by a dx, right? So now you'll notice that the x's and y's are separated, right? And again, this is something that we looked at last time, but now we're going to go over it again. Using algebra, I can figure out how to separate the variables. Now there's an important thing that must occur here. Notice one, the differentials 
Now the differentials are the dy and the dx. That's what we call the differentials. R to the top and to the right of the sides of the equation. Right? So that's, that's one important thing. Um, so if you were to separate the variables in such a way that, uh, so, so, and, and instead of saying they are to the top and to the right, let me say they must be to the top and to the right. So for example, if you were to separate the X's and Y's and you were to write it something like this, one over DX and Y over DY, at this point we're gonna be like, well, this guy must be new. What are you doing? What are you, what are you doing out here, right? That doesn't make any sense, right? You cannot have the D's in the bottom or uh, if you have something like uh, dy1 over y equals dx, uh, makes no sense. Now, of course, you have to study differentials on a more rigorous theoretical level to understand why it's important that our notation is in a certain position, but it's actually important that the notation is in a certain position. When you separate the variables, you have to figure out a way to separate them so that the x's and y's are separate, but also the differentials are to the top and to the right. They cannot be in the denominator and they cannot be to the left of anything. Okay. So that's the first thing that's important. Now, once you do that, what you can do is you can integrate both sides. So notice that there's an invisible one here in front of the DX. What you'll do is you can now integrate both sides. Now you'll see that the notation starts to look very familiar. This looks like uh, when you want to just do an indefinite integral, okay? And at this point, we can integrate, right? So a differential equation involves derivatives. So obviously when we want to get to a situation without derivatives, the fundamental theorem of calculus kind of indicates to us that we are going to want to integrate to get rid of the derivatives. Uh, so what is the integral on the, on the left? No, technically wrong there in the chat. Okay, so someone corrected the left side of the equation. So, so the suggestion was ln of y equals x. Now this is incorrect for a couple of reasons. One of them is you're missing the absolute values. So that's the first thing. There is something else that's off. Plus c, right. So this we spoke about yesterday. Do not forget plus c's when you're doing an indefinite integral. Do not forget the absolute values on your ln of y's. Okay, so that would be what the integral looks like. Okay, so these are little nuances that we have to be careful with. Right now, here we have a plus c. In the original, our general solution, we had a constant multiple of c. You are going to see where that c comes from in the front. Um, now, if I wanted to solve for the y explicitly, what would I do here? How do I solve this equation? raise both sides to the power of e, right? So you take, you can e both sides. That's how you get rid of a logarithm. So you raise both sides to the power of e. And now on this side, uh, you would just have y. Uh, and on this side, you now have the c e to the x. And I explained where that came from before. So one, uh, if I have e to the x plus c in the power, this is the same as e to the x times e to the c by laws of exponents. And then this I just think of as some other constant, right? Big C, right? So that's what this guy is. Right? It's just a constant, right? 
Um, also, since C can be plus or minus, right? It's just an arbitrary constant. I could plug in a positive or a negative value. We can drop the absolute values on the Y. So technically, when I e both sides, I should still have an absolute value of y over here. But of course, your absolute value is going to just uh, attach a negative or a positive sign to, to the y, depending on whether it's positive or negative. However, the c already accounts for that, so I'm allowed to drop the absolute values. And this, ladies and gentlemen, now is the solution. So if you didn't see that before, that c e to the x was the solution, or was the general solution, you could actually figure it out by hand. And one way to do that is to use separation of variables. Now we also saw, uh, and, and we saw earlier how to find, I'm gonna give you guys some more examples here, as you can see, obviously. Uh, I'm gonna do these together. Uh, and we saw earlier how to find the C. So this gives Y equals three E to the X is the particular solution. Um, so Now, whenever you're given an initial condition, you do want to find the particular solution. So if someone gives you a differential equation with uh, an initial condition, you are not allowed to stop at the point where you have a C. Uh, you must actually continue, right? So, must find this whenever initial condition is given. Okay. And we saw how to find the figure out what that the C was three here. But this is uh, an analytic method, right, solving by hand of figuring out that C E to the X would be the solution here. And to find a particular solution, we have three um, uh, E to the X. Now, so far, any questions here? We're, we're gonna do some examples together. Uh, I just wanted to walk through. Now, of course, this is a very easy example, right? We could even know what the, the answer was by eyeballing it, but I wanted to show you how you would actually work through something because in more complicated cases, uh, you are going to have to work through something. Um, so before moving on uh, and doing some more examples, any questions on what was done so far? Anything you didn't understand? Are we all on the same page? Are we all cool? Can I move on? Okay, yeah, why do you keep the plus C on the right side when integrating? Uh, so this was something I mentioned yesterday, I don't know if you were absent, but it's not that I only did a plus C on the right side. I really had a plus C on this side as well. You can th think of it as there was, a, there was a plus C one on this side and then there's a plus C two on that side and then I moved both C's to one side and then uh, combine them into a big C. So it's customary to put, just combine all the arbitrary constants and move them to the right. Right, so when you integrate, you get a plus C whenever you do an indefinite integral. You're gonna get one on the left and on the right. However, traditionally, just to make life simpler, what we usually do is move all the C's to one side, usually the side that has the independent variable, so normally that's gonna be on the right side, and then we combine them all into one big C. You'll also notice that at any point, there are a bunch of different C's here. So technically when I integrated, uh, when I integrated the Y, I would have, a, when I integrated the, the left side, I would have a plus C one, then I integrated the right side, I would get a plus C two. Technically when I combine them, 
uh, there's there, there's going to be a C3. And technically, when I rewrite the E to the C as another constant, this is a fourth constant, C4. Now, all of these guys in general can be different. However, at the end of the day, I know they're all going to combine into one big thing. And I'm going to be able to find the particular solution. So it actually does not matter that you keep track of the constants on the way down. As long as it's not a separate constant, uh, the constant is just morphing and transforming as we go down, but we will figure out its value. So there's no need to keep track of all these arbitrary constants. It just, it just makes your life a little bit more complicated. So that's why we just bring everything to one side, write it as just a single variable, not a single variable, well, it is a variable, but we write it as a single arbitrary constant. So yeah, so, so that is not really an oversight. That is a very deliberate decision um, just to make our lives easier. Because at the end of the day, we are going to plug in the value to solve for this, the specific C that we need that makes the final solution works out. So yeah. Okay, any other questions? All right, let's move, uh, let's move forward. We're gonna do these, or uh, I guess more specifically, you are going to do these. Uh, I'm going to have volunteers kind of tell me what they think I should do. Uh, we're gonna do these four examples. Let's start off with the first one. I left a lot of space here. So, yeah, uh, go. Part A, suggestions. Chime in or type in the chat what you think we should do. Solve this differential equation. Okay, so Eugene is like, separate the variables. Now you don't wanna differentiate both sides. We have a first derivative. So if we start differentiating, we're gonna end up getting more derivatives. We'll get a second derivative. We don't wanna do that. We don't wanna differentiate. First thing you're going to do is you're going to separate the variables. And we can do that by dividing by y and multiplying by dx. So that would be the first step. Now you see that all the variables are separated. So that's the first step. Next, you are going to integrate both sides. So now I just put like a, then integrate both sides. So you can put this here, this here. Okay. Now we saw already that this gives us ln of absolute value of y, the integral of x. Hopefully you guys remember that's x squared over two plus c. And again, there's a plus c on both sides, but I move them both to one side. Uh, so how do I solve for Y? What is the solution for Y going to look like? Right, you're gonna E both sides and then the E to the C, you can move to the front to get a new constant. So this means that your Y is equal to C E to the X squared over two. This is the general solution. I do not need to find a particular solution because they, I wasn't given an initial condition. Uh, and one thing I, I, I'm pretty sure I typed it up somewhere. Yeah, here, initial value problem. Uh, so you will notice that your textbook is called uh, initial value and boundary value problems. Uh, that's in the name of your textbook. Uh, where does that name come from? When you have a differential equation and they give you an initial condition, you call that list an initial value problem. If you have a PDE with different initial conditions, you call that a boundary value problem. So that's, that's where that call, that's called. So this would be called an initial value problem, right? Here, this is just a differential equation, right? So the equation by itself is a differential equation. Once you attach initial conditions to it, it's called an initial value problem. So this was again, not a bad differential equation. The function c e to the x squared over two is a function such that its derivative will be x times the original function. 
All right. So hopefully that, that one wasn't so bad. Uh, let's move on to the other one. Let me make these guys a little bigger. Let's see. Okay, moving on. Here's another one. Uh, suggestions. Y prime equals X E to the X plus Y. And um, I, I mean, most of the time this goes without saying, but let me just say it anyway, especially now since we're uh, teaching this, uh, we're doing the distance learning thing. It's very important that you engage with the material. So whenever I pause and I give you guys a chance to actually um, make a suggestion or try the problem on your own, please do it. I know it's very tempting to just sit there in front of your computer and just wait for me to write down the answers. And students do this anyway in class. They just wait to copy the answers off the board. But I do want you to engage I don't particularly care if you get the right answer. Don't worry about being correct all the time. Um, if you have any misconceptions, I need to know about them so I can correct them. So say whatever you want, make a guess. Uh, and if, if you're right, yeah, you'll know that you're right. I'll write it down. And if you're wrong, you'll learn that you're wrong. But you'll learn in a low stakes environment because it's better that you get things wrong now and get corrected then you would get to something wrong on a test, right? So definitely make suggestions. Um, it's not going to be embarrassing to anybody. Uh, it's a learning experience. Really try to engage with the material. Really try to actually make suggestions and engage as much as possible. Uh, I just want everyone to be comfortable doing that. It is better for you. It will make you. It will make it easier for you to learn. That being said, all right. So we have a couple suggestions here. So Eugene uh, thinks we should break up the exponential, which is a good first step. Roberto took it a step further. So yeah, using the laws of exponents. Using the laws of exponents, you can realize that this is just x e to the x times e to the y. And so now when I separate the variables, uh, this is going to look like 1 over e to the y dy equals uh, x e to the x dx. All right, uh, now what? Sure, we integrate. How do I integrate the left side? So I have suggestions about u substitution, or is it the absolute value of y? Uh, neither. How do I get 1 over e to the y? I divided both sides by e to the y. Right. So here we have to remember our Cal 2. If you wanted to integrate 1 over e to the y, so someone asked how I get the y, e to the y here. I rewrote this and then I divided both sides by e to the y. So I took this e to the y and then I divided it and moved it to the other side. Of course, uh, Cal 2, what we learned will tell you, you rewrite this. And then you just uh, integrate that. This is minus e to the minus y. Of course, there's going to be a plus c, but we're going to combine all the plus c's on the other side. 
how do I integrate x e to the x? Integration by parts, what would the parts be? What are the parts here? Right, u equals x, your dv equals uh, e to the x, right? So not the, the, not the other way around. Of course, now when you do that, you'll get x e to the x minus e to the x. Um, e, x e to the x is a very common integral. Eventually you do that so often that you just remember it. Uh, that's what it's going to end up looking like. Uh, so uh, this is not a Cal 2 class, so I'm not really gonna teach you integration techniques and by parts used on the, on the right. I told you on uh, all the things that you have to brush up on um, in the last lecture. So be sure to brush up on that. If, you, if you're getting, if you're making guesses uh, for what to do in a calculus context and you realize, oh, geez, I, I don't, I, don't re I didn't remember. Oh yeah, I forgot that. Yeah, now you know some of the things that you need to brush up on over this semester. Um, calculus two in specific, specifically, uh, you're going to need to remember your calculus two very well, meaning all your integration techniques trig substitution, integration by parts, partial fractions, substitution, how to solve equations from uh, like everything from pre-calculus. Uh, it, it's all going to come back. You're going to need all that information. Um, so yeah, uh, how do I, can I solve for y here? How do I solve for y? So this, by this, this at this stage, we have what's called an implicit solution, right? Because the, the, we haven't found y by itself on one side. Uh, let's find the explicit one. All right, so how do I go about finding the explicit solution? Uh, we cannot take ln of both sides, at least not as written, because you will notice that the left side is a negative number. You cannot take the logarithm of a negative number. Right, e to the minus y is always positive. So negative e to the minus y is always negative. Log of a negative is undefined. Now what? Right, move the sign to the other side, right? What this basically means is that, how you can think of it is that both sides are negative. So what I can do is multiply both sides by a negative. So this would give me e to the x minus x e to the x. And again, I don't care about a negative C or a plus C. It's just a plus C. It's always a constant, right? And then I can ln both sides. So this gives me minus Y is equal to ln of E to the X minus X E to the X plus C. So my Y is equal to negative ln of e to the x minus x e to the x plus c. And now we have, uh, we have our explicit solution. Any questions on that before we move on? Seems not. Let's move on to the next example. So for all of these, we're just getting practice on the technique of separation of variables. Right? Want to make sure you guys know how to do that, have some practice doing that. Give me some suggestions for this one.
All right, so we're jumping in with uh, the integrating. Um, we cannot integrate as is because you'll notice that on the right side, there are X's and Y's and there's a DX. So we can integrate. We have to first separate the variables. I need to separate the X's and Y's. Okay, dividing by an X squared seems like a good idea. However, you will create a division by X squares here. Like if I divide by X squares to get rid of them here, you will also need to divide by them here. So that's not going to work. That's not going to get me separate. That's not going to allow me to separate the variables. Also, I want you to be aware that you can actually add the 4y squared to the other side. Because if you were to multiply out, if you were to multiply out, this is actually x squared y squared dx plus x squared dx minus 4y squared dx uh, minus 4dx. So if you, you can't move this guy to the other side because he's attached to the dx. So that's also an issue. Other suggestions? There we go, Abigail saw it. Factor by grouping. Yeah, throwback, right? It is legal to distribute the DX in general. It, it's just not helpful in this case. Because it doesn't allow me to separate. However, factoring by grouping. Notice that in the first situation, X squared is a common factor that I can factor out. And for the second two, minus four is a common factor that I can factor out. And then now the y squared plus one is a common factor that I can factor out. I can write it like this. And then obviously we're gonna divide by the y squared plus one. Now the variables are separated, okay? So factor by grouping. Now there's an important lesson here. One thing I want you to notice is when we say something is, uh, we can do separation of variables on a problem, that problem is called separable. And I, I definitely type that somewhere. Yeah, down here. That problem is called separable. This means we should be able to separate the variables. However, you have to obey certain rules. So your algebra has to be on point here. So in general, you have to have a function of y times the dy, and then a function of x times the dx, which kind of limits what you're allowed to do to move things across the equal sign. And this is why distributing the dx wasn't the thing you want to do. Because had I done that and moved the guy to the other side, I would have had to have done it by addition. This creates a separation between my dy and the y to y squared. Like we can't have that. You have to have an entire function of y times a dy and then the function of x times a dx. You want to get into a situation that it makes sense to integrate both sides, which means you can't just move stuff to the other side willy nilly. You have to have a very specific way of moving them. Usually it's going to be through multiplication and division you're not going to tend to want to use addition or subtraction to move things to the other side, which means distributing things and separating everyone uh, is usually not going to be, um, uh, is usually not going to be the way you want to go. Factoring so that we have different factors and then dividing or multiplying, that is going to be a, a good way. Um, so uh, I have a question here. Is our first goal always to separate the variables? Uh, if separating the variables is possible, then yes. So this is just like, uh, as I mentioned before, and I mentioned this yesterday as well, this class is going to feel a lot like Calc 2, um, in the sense that if I were to give you a random integral, right, is substitution always going to work? The answer is no. However, if substitution can work, it is what you should do, right? So it's going to be one of those things when you see a differential equation, separation of variables is always something that you're going to look to see if it can work. And if it can work, then yes, your goal is to separate the variables. 
and separate them in a specific way. There are situations, though, in which this method will not work. So, but at this point in time, I am teaching you separation of variables, and we're going through examples for that. So yes, for all of these ones, your first goal is to separate the variables. But this is not in general. It's just for this set of examples here. Okay. So equations where you can actually use this method that we're currently doing, these guys are called separable differential equations. However, there are non-separable. There are equations out there that no matter what kind of algebra trick I pull, I can never get a way to separate the x's and y's. And you'll see some of these in your homework and, and, and all that good stuff. However, for these, we're using separation of variables. So yes, our first goal is to figure out a way to separate the variables. Usually, this is going to be with multiplication or division because I need, I need a function times the dif differentials. On top of that, the differentials are always to the top and to the right. Now, if you're taking notes, these are some things that you should be writing down in your notebook, all the bullet points I just mentioned. Separation of variables is one of the first things you want to look for. That's one thing I would write down. Second thing, the differentials are always to the top and to the right. Third thing, you want to move things from one side to another using multiplication and division only. You do not want to be separate from the differentials. You need to be multiplying the differentials. Okay? So that's, that's going to tell you what algebra moves are you allowed to do, what algebra moves are. I don't want to say illegal because you can't, there are legal things you can do. It's just it's not going to be helpful for the method. Okay, um, let's actually continue. How do you integrate? So at this point, everything is in, 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 in tip top shape to integrate. You can integrate both sides. So how do we integrate one over y squared plus one? Right, that's arctan y. And then on the other side, it's just the power rule. So that is something I do expect you guys to know that the integral of this is the tangent inverse function. move both plus these to the other side. How can I solve for y? That solution is implicit. Yeah, take the tangent of both sides. So this means that the y is going to be the tangent of And that is the solution to the differential equation. If I have this differential equation, here is a function that solves that differential equation. It has no derivatives in it, but it's a relationship between the independent and dependent variables in such a way that uh, it will make this differential equation true. On top of that, which is something that is desirable, though not always possible, we have the solution in explicit form, where I isolate the dependent variable on one side. And the trick here was something that we learned way back, factor by grouping. You have to remember all your algebra, all your pre-calc, all your calc one, all your calc two, at least the computational parts and the calculus parts. Okay, uh, dy dx. No. So it's, it's actually, uh, so let me note, writing it as tangent of x cubed over three minus four x, close parentheses plus c would be incorrect. Those are not the same. You take the tangent of both sides. It includes taking the tangent of the plus c. So it's very important that you remember the plus C at all, but you have to remember it at the point of integration. You can't do the plus C after. If the plus C is outside of the tangent, it's kind of like someone integrated, forgot to put the plus C, and then they added a plus C at the end. You will actually get a different answer by doing that. Yeah. Okay, last one. I think it's the last example here in this section. So here, I would separate the variables. Of course, I would integrate both sides. 
Uh, what's the integral of 1 over y squared? All right, minus 1 over y. Of course, you get that by rewriting this as y to the minus 2. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. That's x plus c. What I can do here is just uh, flip both sides and take the negative. So that's that. So that was separation of variables, okay? Right, and here is where I tell you what separable actually means. It means you can write it in the form that, right? Some function of y times dy equals some function of x times dx, okay? Now, whenever you can do that, such a differential equation is called a separable differential equation. And also, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, this guy's off. Also, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, the, this guy got separated, separating the boxes. Move these notes up. Give me a second, let me just clean up some of these things here. All right, so we just looked at a bunch of examples of separable ODEs, and it's separable, what that means is if it can be written in a form here. Now, as I mentioned, this is one of the easiest methods around. It's something that you're always going to look for. So if you're given a differential equation, one of the first things you're going to want to, oh, someone asked me to go back up to here, to that previous example. Okay, so um, separation of variables, it's one of the easiest things to get done. So it's something that you should be eyeballing to see if it can work out like regardless, right? So you see something where you see a random ODE. One of the first things you're gonna do, if, especially if it's a first order, this is kind of a little bit trickier for higher orders, uh, is see, could I separate the X's and Y's? And if you can, then do it and integrate. It's going to be the easiest way to get to the solution for that differential equation. Um, and separable is, is a differential equation what, that this can work on. We call them separable. And it means you can write the differential equation in that form, meaning you can use multiplication and division to separate the x's and y's such that you can have a function of y times dy equals a function of x times dx. And whenever that can happen, we call it separable. And the method that we did can work. If it can't happen, we say it's not separable. And at this point, this goes back to something that I was mentioning yesterday. A big part of this class is learning about methods for solving a differential equation. So at any given time, there are times when sometimes the conceptual part of what I'm talking about is going to be lost on you. And a lot of times the, it will come. You shouldn't have to panic if I said something theoretical that you don't get right away. Um, what you do want to make sure that you get right away, when, when, when I'm explaining something, what you want to make sure that you get through your head is this kind of, uh, these two pieces of information, the form and the method, right? Now the form often depends on the ca ca classification. It's a first order, it, or it's a first order linear, or it's a first order separable. So you need to be able to recognize the form of the differential equation that you're looking at. So once I, you see a differential equation and you identify it as a first order, then you can check, well, is it separable? Or you might look for something else. Then once you know that it's, 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 it is separable, uh, then you can go through the method separation of variables, in which case I would say uh, you can write this out. You can write down what it means for something to be separable and you should put this in your notes. You should also put the method for how to solve that. So for example, a very important skill is for you to recognize the kind of ODE you're looking at and then recognize the method that will go with that ODE and make sure at minimum what you understand by the end of every class are those two pieces of information. 
and then you can slowly uh, work your way up to the other ones. So for example, here, I would put in my notes or on a cheat sheet if I wanna put uh, things on a piece of paper to study from, I would say something like, okay, uh, separable ODEs. I'll have this little blurb. There will be a little box on my paper that has separable ODEs. And I would say something like, I'll ex uh, do the basics. Can be expressed as uh, f of y dy equals g of x dx. And then, so that's my definition. Then I would say here, method. What I would do is one, separate variables. i.e. write in this form. Second, integrate both sides. Third, uh, solve for y. Or uh, if initial condition is given, initial condition is given, sorry, someone just called my cell phone and uh, made me lost my train of thought. Solve for the C. Okay. And also, I would say, write in your mistakes uh, also. So your note should be very personal to you. I would say, write in uh, any personal notes that helps you specifically avoid mistakes. So let's say you were uh, one of the persons who guessed earlier, oh, let's just distribute the dx and then add the y squared dx to the other side. At this point, if I, I told you that that would be illegal, but if you realize that that was your first intuition, that was your knee jerk reaction, you need to make sure that that's not a mistake you're ever going to make again. So for you personally, uh, your notes would include a little note down here that says only use multiplication and division. Uh, make sure we are attached, not separated by a plus or minus, to the differentials. Right? So not everyone would need to put that note in their notebook, but if you realize that that was a mistake that you made, make sure that you write these things down. Make sure that your brain knows to look out for this thing, right? That's how you're gonna study. And this is what you're going to, you're going to want to get in the habit of doing this for this class. So when we go through this class, there are going to be many different kinds of differential equations that I'm going to introduce to you. There are gonna be many different methods that goes with each of these different kinds of differential equations. There are times when you are just going to be in a situation where a random differential equation is given to you and you need to solve it, and you are not told what the classification is, you're not told what method to use, you just have to figure it out. In, to, in, in, in service of that, being able to do that, one thing I would recommend is to fill in your notes with these particular things. Uh, make sure that every time I cover a different kind of a differential equation and a method, you write down a little blurb in a separate notebook where all these little formulas are in one place. Uh, no examples, just tell me about the form and the strategy, right? Uh, and I have a question here. Yes, in general, they can work on higher order differential equations. However, it's it becomes much harder when you're in a higher order differential equation. You have to be in a very specific situation. It, ha it, it has to be in a, where separation of variables can work in higher order will be a situation where you can kind of quote unquote do a substitution so that you can not, you can think of all the variables as in higher derivatives than they actually appear. So it, it, it's, 
it's it's much harder to find a, a separation of variables scenario occurring for a higher order. But it's pretty common for first orders, at least in, in this class. Um, but yeah, as long as you can separate things so that you have differentials on the right and to the top, then you can integrate both sides. As long as you can write it in such a way that your notation for integration would look make sense when you write it on paper, separation of variables can work. Now, obviously, if you have a d squared y dx squared, this is very rarely true because you can't have an integral of f of y times d squared y. Like, what does that even mean? You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's going to be a very particular kind of situation uh, where you can actually separate the differentials. At the end of the day, you need to be able to write something that looks like a dy and a dx or a dy and a dt. Um, but yeah, it's very important that you, uh, throughout this course, you have this kind of idea in mind that you need to know for all the topics, what is the form of the differential equation that we covered in this topic? What is the method for solving this particular form of a differential equation? What are the mistakes that I made? When Javon asked me what was my input for this example and I said this thing and it was wrong, what was that thing? Let me make a note that I should not do that thing, right? Now, once you actually cover that, you know what the correct thing to do is, and you also know what the incorrect thing to avoid is, then what chance, what, what, what choice do you have but to get the problem correct? You know what I mean? If you know everything that you should be doing, and you know everything that you shouldn't be doing, and you have the skills to pull off what you should be doing, which by the way, if you have algebra and calculus skills, you have the skills, then you're just going to get everything right. That's, that's how you're going to do it. Okay, so whenever you're studying, you're studying with a specific goal and intention in mind. What are the forms of the differential equations? What are the methods that go with these differential equations? What are the important concepts for me to know, the do's and the don'ts? Once you have that, you write them in a separate notebook, put those all in one place. You don't want it littered around with examples and notes. Put all these information in short, small, manageable chunks in a separate notebook and you are going to study from that notebook and you're going to keep that with you whenever you're studying or going through homework. Okay, so that was just some study tips there. Okay, moving on. So like I said, separating your variables is one of the easiest techniques out there. So if you can eyeball it and see that it will work, you should try to get it to work. Here is something else that might occur. Uh, direction fields is something else I'm gonna talk about. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I'm not gonna have you uh, drawing a lot of these, but this is another viable method uh, when, um, when finding an analytic solution is difficult. So a direction field is just a way that we can solve a differential equation graphically. So we can essentially just plot slopes and figure out what the differential equation is telling us to do. So for example, here, notice what this is saying here. This says the slope at any point is the y value. Notice that that's what this says, right? If I say dy dx equals y, essentially what I'm saying is, oh, the slope, which is dy dx, is equal to the y value. So I am now in a situation where I can think about this graphically then, right? I will be able to figure out that, oh, if I want to find the slope of the solution, then it must be the case that the slope of the solution is equal to the y value at any point. So if I were to go through and actually plot uh, little vectors that represent the slope of my solution, what would it have to look like? Well, when y is zero, the slope is zero everywhere. So at every point along the x-axis, I have a zero slope. When y is one, so everywhere along this line, I have the slope is one. So I have little, I can think of little chunks of tangent lines like that. When y is two, the slope is two. So I have steeper tangent lines all along y equals two.
when the slope is three, they get even steeper. Then I can realize if I go down to negative one, then the slope looks like this. It's going. If I go down to negative two, then it's even steeper in the negative direction. So all the slopes look like that. So notice what I have here. You can think of this as a vector field if you define vectors to be here. But notice that here what we have is a slope field. We just have a field of things that tells me what the slope is behave, behaving like. And notice here, if I put when x equals 0, y equals 3, this is the point 0, 3. I want the solution that passes through that point. OK, so hold on. Uh, let's move this. So here I did a, a slope field. And so by following what the slope field is telling me to do, I know what the solution has to look like. It passes through this point, And when it's down here, it's at a slope of 1. Then it goes to a slope of close to zero as it approaches the y-axis. And then the slope keeps increasing as I move along here. And so this here is the solution with y of zero equals three. Now, of course, there are other solutions, right? So I could have a solution that's passing through two. I could have a solution that passes through minus one or minus two, right? So the blue is the other solutions. Right? So there's a, or, and there's this zero solution, which is running along the x axis. But in general, you'd realize that you have a bunch of solutions here. Okay? You'll also notice that the graph of all of these look like exponentials. Note these are graphs of exponentials. Right? This one is minus e to the minus e to the minus x <laughs> minus e to the the minus x, right? Or minus e to the x. This one is minus two e to the x. This one is three e to the x. This one here would be two e to the x, and so on and so forth. Right? So graphically you can know what the solution would look like. And if you're in a case where it's very difficult for you to solve for the equation, what you can do is you can figure out graphically what the equation would look like roughly, and then you can have a, a, a computer interpolate uh, points on that equation. And so this is another way to kind of solve, quote unquote, the differential equation. At least look at what the graphical uh, solution would behave like. Um, and so that is what a direction field is. Now, we have about six more minutes. Um, so that's another thing. And again, not going to do too much by way of direction fields, but it's, it's another cool way. It's a graphical way to solve a differential equations. Um, the thing is, solving differential equations, and this is something I'll talk about more in general, is very hard in general. Uh, I showed you separation of variables, and it might, you might get the impression, oh, differential equations isn't that bad. It's easy. It turns out, by far, most differential equations we do not know how to solve them, at least not by hand through calculus that you will have in Calc 1 and 2. A lot of the times in this class, that will be the case. But in general, it's not the case. Sometimes you have to pull out all sorts of methods to figure out how to find the solution to a differential equation and have computers to help you and all that, all that stuff. And direction fields is one way. Have the computer plot the graph of the slopes and then find a, a, a graph that passes through it. Then approximate that graph and then Boom, that's your solution. Uh, find a tolerance that gets it to work for whatever situation you want it to work for.
So that is a direction field. And I don't know if I want to rush through this in another four minutes or whatever, but I guess we'll wrap up there. This section ends with one more thing that I'm just going to spend a short time on. Uh, it's a population model, one of the naive population models that are out there. Um, it's called the harvesting model or the Malthus model, which is a specific situation. Um, but I guess we'll stop there for today and we'll pick up with that for tomorrow. And, by, and so this will take like five or 10 minutes for me to get through um, and the beginning of next class. And then that actually wraps up everything we want to do in chapter one, it turns out. Uh, we're going to spend a, a decent amount of time in chapter two and three. Uh, chapter four is going to go by relatively quickly because once uh, you have the theory from chapters two and three, the other stuff we're going to do is going to go by a lot quicker. That being said, we're going to stop there. We're going to wrap up. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, unless there are any questions before we go. No. Okay, I guess that's it. So as usual, I will uh, post the video for this whenever it's done processing as well as the PDF and uh, you guys know how to access that now. Um, but yeah, we are going to stop there. Pick up with the other class. All right, take care, be safe out there everyone. Uh, it's been a crazy year. Keep safe, start studying. Remember to check into WebWork, make sure that you can actually get into the homework system. I will see you guys tomorrow, which we're going to talk about. Uh, the main thing we'll talk about tomorrow, I guess, is going to be first order linear ODEs. We're going to talk about population models for a little bit, five or 10 minutes. Then we'll go into first order linear ODEs. It's going to be fun stuff. You're going to learn how to solve a different kind of differential equation. For now, that's it. Uh, we will end there and I will see you guys in the next one. Ciao.